Andrew Snelling, correct? correct? And you are a geologist. Correct, yes. I have my PhD in geology from the University of Sydney, Australia. Very nice. So uh, talk to us about how geology supports uh, Noah's flood. Well, many geologists are looking in the wrong place. They say there's no evidence for Noah's flood out there, and that's because they've, they've, they've dated the rocks according to the millions of years. Whereas if they start by reading the Bible, they'd get the clues from the Bible. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 7 that the floodwaters covered all the high hills under the whole of the heaven and even the mountains were covered. And so that means that and all flesh died, everything died that wasn't on board the ark. So that means animals and plants were swept away, they were killed, moving waters would rip up sand and mud and lime and therefore I'd expect to find as a geologist billions of dead things called fossils buried in rock layers laid down all over the earth. And that's exactly what we find. Billions of dead things called fossils buried in rock layers uh, all over the earth. You know, even where we are now, here at, in northern Kentucky, uh, it's a very famous area for fossils in the Cincinnati uh, general area, we've got limestone layers, that's lime turned to stone, and we've got clams and corals all smashed up and broken, all these shellfish. And even, even the secular geologists now interpret these layers having been formed by catastrophic storm activity. But the same layers can be traced to other parts of the United States with the same fossils and the same catastrophic activity. We can trace many of the layers across North America. We can trace similar layers across Northern Africa to other parts of the world. We find marine fossils at the tops of mountains like the Himalayas and in the Andes and the and all around the world in, in the Rocky Mountains. And so uh, we've got all these marine fossils that are buried up on the continents. They're not buried, not buried in the ocean. They lived in the ocean, but they're now buried up on the continents. Testimony to the ocean waters coming up and flooding the continents. So uh, the, the geologists, the secular geologists, are looking at the top surface. They're not looking deep enough down to see all these layers. And people say to me, but oh, you know, you've got this type of fossil in this layer and a different fossil in this layer and this fossil and this fossil, and they think that it goes from marine fossils to land fossils in the order of evolution. Well, it's not actually. You've got marine fossils all the way through. Even with the dinosaur fossils, you've got marine fossils buried with them. And in fact, the, the order of the fossils is a burial order of the flood. Because if the flood began in the ocean, ripping up all those marine creatures and burying them on the continents, they would be the first creatures to get buried. And then as the flood waters rose higher, you'd get to, to bury the land animals. And that's exactly what we find. And we've got an exhibit on that, on that here, here in the ark to describe that to people so they can understand it. So everywhere I look, there's abundant evidence in geology that the flood really did occur. We can trust God's word. So the, the, what we see in geology, supports the flood of Noah and not evolution. Correct. Uh, we, don't find, we don't find one type of fossil turning into another. We, we find one particular fossil in one layer and another fossil in another layer, but we don't find the in-between forms. It, it doesn't support evolution. It, it, it supports massive death and burial on a, on a global scale. And that's exactly what the Bible describes. If we go to the first layers that have fossils in them, we go from layers having no fossils to, to layers with, with every one of the body plans uh, of, 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 the, of the major division of creatures. Uh, we call them the phyla. And with, the geologists call that the Cambrian explosion. So we, suddenly, we have layers with no fossils and then we suddenly have trilobites. And the trilobite has a complex lens system with multiple lenses and it's so incredibly complex that we, with our ingenuity, have only been able to build similar lens systems in the last 50 years. And yet there's no hint of an ancestor in the layers below or any transitional forms in going up to the trilobites. And so they appear fully formed, fully, fully functioning because they've been living before the flood and now they're suddenly buried. And so again, the fossils scream out evolution, no, God's word, yes. So do we find fossils that we, of animals we thought were extinct and now we find them still alive? Oh yes, lots of times that's happened. Uh, back, uh, back in the 1900s they thought there was a particular fish that became extinct 65 million years ago. And then uh, they 
I, I saw it just happened to notice what trawler fishermen were bringing in off the southern coast of uh, Africa, and uh, they're bringing in live, live uh, examples of these fish, the coelacanth. And uh, since that time, uh, that was back in 1938. Since that time, we've found hundreds of these you know, off the coast of the Philippines, off the coast of Japan. We're actually filming them live, swimming in the ocean. And they're exactly the same as the fossil one. They haven't changed. Um, as you can tell, my, I've got a very southern accent, but it's further south than Tennessee. It's the other side of the world. And in the land of Australia, just uh, west of Sydney, there's mountains with deep ravines and, and uh, forests that are almost impenetrable. It's a world heritage area, and it's only about 60 miles from downtown Sydney, a, a city of five million people, and that's where I, I grew up. Well, in 1994, a national park ranger was having a weekend expedition as a private thing, and he came across a grove of trees that he'd never seen before. And what he actually discovered was a pine tree that the scientists had thought had become extinct 160 million years ago. And the interesting thing is the fossils of that particular pine tree are only another 60 miles away from where the living ones are found today. And so it's called the Wallamai pine, and it's actually named after that uh, park. It's w Wallamaya, not Nobilis, because it was David Noble was the park ranger who found them. And they found they found about two or three groves of these trees. They've, they've taken specimens of them and, and, and propagated them. And you can now find them in herbariums all around the world. But what was this tree doing for 160 million years? Where was it hiding? How did it survive if the 100 million, 160 million years really happened? But it makes more sense if the fossils were buried in the flood only a few thousand years ago, then these trees have repropagated since the flood and have survived in that area uh, until the present day. And that's only a few thousand years. So do we find fossils according to the evolutionary train of thought that should not be found together? Uh, well, that's an interesting question because what happens is the evolutionary view has, has certain fossils in a certain order and they say that certain fossils shouldn't be found with one another. But in the history of the study of fossils, there have been instances where they've found fossils where they didn't expect to find them. So instead of admitting that that's a problem, well, they do admit it's a problem, but to that version of evolution. So what they do is they change they change their ideas of evolution and, and now say, well, this creature evolved earlier. And, now, and, and, and so that's what the evolutionary theory is so rubbery, they can move it around to accommodate whatever they, whatever they find. So that's, that's the answer to that question. Every time you find a fossil, but, but, but quite frankly, I'd love to find a T-Rex and a human fossil together, but we don't. Has there ever been an animal, uh, has there ever been a dinosaur and a human found together? Not as far as we know. Um, the closest hints we've had are some that have claimed that there's been diamond, di dinosaur and human footprints found together. But uh, while the Bible says that dinosaurs and man lived at the same time and therefore lived on the earth together, we don't know that they necessarily lived in the same habitat. Uh, we find today different creatures live in different habitats. It's like you go from the top of the Grand Canyon from Ponderosa Pine and, and uh, deer, if you go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you've got cacti and bighorn sheep. And so it appears that in the pre-flood world, the reason I say that is we get certain fossils that are usually buried together, and dinosaur fossils are usually buried with gymnosperms and pines and naked sea plants, whereas mammal fossils are usually found with angiosperms or flowering plants. And that suggests that there were two different ecosystems, though, so the dinosaurs, while they lived at the same time as man, didn't necessarily live in the same areas. And so uh, they were overcome by the flood at different times during the advance of the waters and therefore we don't find them. Then again, we don't find them buried together. Then again, of course, um, we haven't explored all of the world. And I'm not, I'm not trying to argue from silence, but there are still many places that we haven't explored and you never know People may have misidentified bones, and they really are human bones, but we wouldn't know. And so it really is dependent on 
uh, whether we're looking hard enough or and whether we, we identify the veins correctly. And then again, how would you convince a skeptical world that they really were dinosaur human bones that were, were buried together? But we don't find them, and I'm not worried about that uh, because we have abundant evidence in from looking at God's word and comparing with what we see in God's wall that convinces me that the biblical account is the correct view of the Earth's history. So we really shouldn't even expect to find them together? No. no, I don't believe we should expect to find them together because they probably lived in different habitats. Well, that makes perfect sense. You wouldn't live near your predators. No, exactly. And many of them were violent. Uh, evidence that they lived in, in swampy in conditions and environments. Whereas uh, the land of Eden, we're told a river flowed out of Eden so rivers flow downhill, so Eden was actually at a higher elevation and the swampy lowland areas where the dinosaurs lived was probably separated from where people lived. And why would they go, as you say, and, and uh, unless they were hunting them, why would they go and live where their predators were? Makes perfect sense. So have uh, there ever been a transitional form found? Uh, it depends what you mean by a transitional form. Uh, I would, I would just, I would uh, define a transitional form as half a wing, half a, half a, a leg. Uh, even Stephen Jay Gould talked about that. Um, you know, if we're going to have a, 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 a reptile turning into a bird, we ought to expect to find somewhere in between the process uh, bones that were half leg bones and half wing bones. But you also got to remember that at the same time you've got to have a different lung system to, to circulate the blood differently. The bones of a, of a bird are hollow compared to a reptile's bones, so they're totally different. And as he recognised, he, he made a famous statement. He said, what use is half a wing or half a jaw? He said, we in our imagination haven't been able to construct even our imagination functionally the media. So in other words, we can't even imagine what these creatures look like, let, let alone find them. Um, it was David Ralph who said in 1979, he said, well, we're 120 years after Charles Darwin, and we have even fewer examples of transitional forms than we had in Darwin's day. So if you go back to what Darwin said in 1859, he said we had none. So we've got fewer than none still today. And that's true, scientists will make claims, but the claims are merely in their theories that these fossils should fit, but you can't see the evidence of in-between structures. That's what you've got to find. Uh, functional structures that transition between a leg and a wing, or between a fin and a leg, and we don't find those, and we don't find creatures with them. That's pretty cool. So, um, what about polystrata fossils? Yes. Uh, we've got mention of those in the exhibit here. The polystrata fossil, strata fossils are poly meaning many strata, meaning they take many layers to, to uh, get buried. Uh, most fossils actually take a, a quite a bit of sediment to accumulate. And uh, I know of one particular uh, sediment called chalk that the scientists claim forms as a news on the ocean floor today it takes thousands of years to accumulate a fraction of an inch to make these chalk beds. But if you go to the chalk beds in, in um, Kansas, you find uh, dinosaurs, you find fish, uh, fish 14 feet long, turtles 12 feet long, fish with other fish undigested in their stomachs. How are those creatures going to be buried if it was a fraction of an inch at a time uh, over thousands of years? But one of the most interesting polystrate fossils, and so you know, a big creature takes many layers to, to bury it, and so those layers all have to form very quickly. Uh, one of the most interesting examples are fossilised trees that are fossilised ver in a vertical upright position. And uh, I know a number of examples around the world. I've seen them in eastern Australia, but they've all been also been reported in the, in the coal beds in, in England where you've got a, 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 a upright fossil tree buried on top of a coal bed with other layers in between sticking up through another coal bed. And it's taken the coal, the coal bed, all these other layers and another coal bed before it's buried this, this tree. Now the coal is supposed to form in a swamp, swamp that's putrid that causes things to rot. How could these trees survive for thousands of years while all those layers accumulate? 
it, it just doesn't make any sense. It makes more sense that the, the, all the layers form rapid, so rapidly that the tree didn't have time to rot. And so uh, in one of the examples that I've been told in Australia and another one in England, we've had trees, a tree fossils over 150 feet long, wow. well, buried by multiple strata. So they couldn't survive for millions of years waiting to be buried and fossilised. So you would say instead of taking a long time to create a fossil, it takes the right conditions? Correct. It has to be very rapid with the right conditions. You have to bury it. I mean, people say, but look, if you've got uh, no oxygen around, it's, a, it's a, an environment where you haven't got the forces of, rot, of, of, um, of, of oxygen. Well, you've still got bacteria that live in rotting conditions. And uh, you can do experiments with fish and very quickly, even in putrid conditions, they will rot very quickly. So you need, you need to bury the creature rapidly and then you need to have the chemicals in the water buried with the sediments that are going to help to preserve the, 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 the structure and tissues, even the soft tissues of the creature that's been buried. So yes, it, it's not time, it's the right conditions. Last question. How can our readers learn more about geology and creation science? Uh, the best place to go is to the Answers in Genesis website, answersingenesis.org, and the search engine there is very good. Uh, for example, you could type in uh, geologic evidence for the flood and it would take you to a series of seven articles that I wrote on, on that very topic. You can type in radiocarbon and you get articles on radiocarbon dating or, or radiometric dating and you get articles on So it's a great resource. That's the easiest place to go and it's free 24 7. We've got all levels of technical information from uh, general reading articles to in depth scientific articles and they're all available on the website. And of course, it'll lead you to other resources if you want to purchase the books or get physical copies of books, DVDs. They're available through our web store. So answersingenesis.org, www.answersingenesis.org is the website to go to for all this information. Thank you very much, Mr. Stanley. Appreciate the time. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.